and gentlemen, Dominic Christie. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen and on this beautiful sunny Scottish afternoon, good, uh, welcome to Pam Your House. Um, bizarrely, we have air conditioning, but if you are sitting in these seats here right next to the air conditioning, it's a bit chilly. it can get a bit <laughs> chilly. So if you want, if, if at some stage you decide it's too chilly and you want to get up and move over there. Do you mind? No, no, no. no. Are you going to go straight for it? I am. No, oh, there we go. Well, <laughs> you, you will, uh, sorry, you have made a wise decision, sir. If I may say, you have made a wise decision. And the same goes for any of, the, if any of the others get chilly, just, just move over there. Um, ah, a couple of early movers there on that side as well. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to How Heavy, this uh, lecture with funny bits about the history of weights and measures. Uh, our motto is Semper Norwissimum Saipe Ridiculum, which I'm sure you Latin scholars out there will know translates as always interesting, occasionally amusing. And uh, that is what the theme of this lecture will be. You are sitting uh, in the very room uh, in which Adam Smith completed Wealth of Nations. So how about that for a bit of history? And the room has been restored at great expense to be exactly as it was when Adam Smith uh, lived and worked here, right down to little details like um, the wood uh, underneath this paint. The wood in this cupboard would be Dutch tulip wood, imported at great expense from South America. But in those days, um, to have exposed wood was not a fashionable thing. I guess it was associated with with the poor and so this is one of the few, this very modern looking farrow and ball paint was actually one of the few colours of paint that was available at the time. It was only that way um, that they could find the, the correct consistency. And of course there's uh, nothing Adam Smith liked to do more of an afternoon than sit back and watch the football on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> and Smith is buried exactly 37 0.3 metres uh, over there, or as we traditionalists say, a stone's throw. <laughs> and there is, lies the very root of difference between traditional imperial measures and metric. One is fantastically precise, but abstract. Nobody quite knows how 37 metres is. But the other is rooted in the world around us. And we all sort of understand roughly how long a stone's throw is. The reality is that outside of the world of professional cricket, there are few in this world who can actually throw a stone 37 <laughs> metres. <laughs> um, and many people don't understand why Smith is so important. It's often said that Smith was to economics what um, Darwin was to biology and Newton was to physics. And of course, all three of them used imperial measures. Um, <laughs> And here we have another example. We'll start off with another example of the fantastically precise system that is metric and the uh, 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 imperial system that we all understand. Now, let me get my own credentials on the table. I was brought up with the metric system. Um, uh, I was educated with it. I spent my childhood not understanding these weird things called inches on rulers. Centimetres seem to be a much better distance. Um, but here we are through my life, almost all of my vital statistics are measured in imperial. The one that isn't is kilos. I've recently started using kilos quite simply out of convenience because my scales uh, sync with my phone and I haven't got round to changing the settings and putting it in stones and ounces. So now I think in kilos. Um, I'm using a size 18 font uh, here and you may not notice but fonts use the traditional measuring system. One uh, said there would be 72 font points to an inch. And uh, uh, in the morning I like to have 4.9 millilitres of sugar um, in my coffee, or as we call it, a teaspoon. And so I began this lecture pretty ambivalent. I, I just thought it was an interesting subject. And I began, but over the course of doing this lecture, I found myself more and more veering towards imperial measures, traditional measures. Um, and if nothing else, the message of this lecture is that there is a beauty to traditional measures that is worth comprehending and you should only make the choice to discard traditional measures once you appreciate and understand that beauty. It is a 
the accrued wisdom of many, many thousands of years of people. And so that, that's, that, that's, that's the message to, to, to go away with. I'm a big believer in speaking more than one language. I don't believe we should, imp you know, if, if central planners had their way, we'd all be speaking Esperanto. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a beautifully designed language, except nobody uses it. And similarly with measures, it's worth understanding um, more than one language. So I'm going to do conduct a straw poll, and I read this on uh, the internet, so it must be true. Um, we get the expression straw poll, you would hold uh, a piece of straw up to the wind and see which way the wind was blowing. And that's where we get. So we'll see which way the wind is blowing in here. And I'll just do, put your hands up. I'm going to ask you if you broadly favour imperial or if you broadly favour metric or if you're ambivalent. So let's start off. Who is broadly in favour of metric? Um, quite a few. I would say 30, 40% of the room. Who is broadly in favour of traditional measures? A few more out here on the far right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, who is ambivalent? Okay, so we're, I would say slightly fewer ambivalent. The rest of you have already decided what you think, um, which is good. And so let's um, continue on from there. We, we are living through these culture wars, as I'm sure you all know. And Facebook, um, apparently, can ask you four questions. And from those four questions, it is able to predict your, what your response will be to any number of other questions with a greater accuracy than your spouse. How about that? And um, so, not for example, surprising. not so. <laughs> so, for example, in the 2016 general election, somebody found out that if you had an American car, you would be more likely to vote for Donald Trump. And so, and if you had a foreign car, you would be more likely to vote Democrat. And so, it was a great part of the Trump strategy was to target swing voters. It was quite easy to find out what cars people drove. And the, the strategy was to um, target um, American owning American car owners in swing states. It's a very powerful tool. But I am able to ask you one question, and from that one question, I can tell you exactly what your politics are. <laughs> so I'm going to use you as a guinea pig, sir. <laughs> Who did you vote for? <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, that was the that was the question. Who did you vote? For? Um, but it's bizarre. In these culture wars, you tend to find sides: traditionalists, conservatives, people who believe in low tax, limited government will be on one side. People who you know believe in state planning and uh, modernists, socialists. Um, architecture is an incredible predictor of people's uh, views. There are some who find this beautiful, that is of course St Paul's Cathedral, and there are others that cannot see there is a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, by the way, is Britain's ugliest building. Uh, it's even got a stupid name, Nova Victoria. Um, and similarly, there are some who believe the licence fee should be voluntary, while there are others who like Gary Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> the weights and measures find themselves at the heart of the culture wars. We have those that favour traditional measures. I keep saying traditional measures because they were only called imperial after 1824, when it was, um, there was a, a Weights and Measures Act in 1824 um, to standardise imperial measures because we felt slightly challenged by this new French metric system. So we standardised our own imperial measures and then exported them uh, out through the empire, hence imperial. Whereas the, um, in America, they actually call what we could have called imperial measures English measures because they came over with the settlers. But by the time of we had imperial measures standardised, they had long since parted company with us. But anyway, um, by way of an example of how this is at the culture wars, we have this... Uh, election pledge from Boris Johnson, an era of generosity and tolerance towards uh, traditional measurements, to which the Guardian cried, xenophobia <laughs> and pseudoscience. <laughs> but leaders, now, as we, here we have a map of the world, and we can see that all of the world, with the gallant exceptions of Liberia, Myanmar and the United States, uh, the only nations in the world with strong enough national cultures to withstand the onslaught of metric. Um, the, the whole world has been metrified. But that is official. And in practice, 
what we see happening is more and more people using traditional measure, measures, but with a different name. And so, for example, the gap between a kilo and a gram is very big. The gap between um, uh, a metre and a centimetre is very big. I asked my son to measure, who's totally metric, I asked him to uh, guess what the, the width of our kitchen sink was, just as a little experiment, and he guessed it by thinking in 30 centimetre distances, uh, because we all have the 30 centimetre ruler. But the 30 centimetres is, of course, a foot. Um, 25 grams is a very common um, measure in food. It's an ounce, give or take. Similarly, the etto is an Italian word for 100 grams. Uh, it's four ounces, quarter of a pound. 500 grams, again, uh, is roughly a pound. In China, they've actually is, um, officially made the liang uh, scientifically as a word for 50 grams. It's two ounces. And so this is a common theme that we'll see. Now, there is a very strong case for one universal system of measurement. And this story here demonstrates why. 1905, the greatest fire in American history. Um, fire engines from New York, from New Jersey, from Washington, all came to Baltimore to try and help put out this fire, only to discover that Baltimore had a different system of valves, of taps, and none of them could connect their hoses to the Baltimore taps, and they could only stand on and watch as Baltimore burnt to the ground. Similarly, we had this flight in, uh, I think it was 1983, when there was some confusion between pounds and kilograms, and the, uh, the plane actually ran out of fuel um, at 41,000 feet, and the pilot famously glided it to the ground and no one was injured, um, quite simply because of confusion uh, over weights. Um, another example, we have the Mars Orbiter, which crashed in 1999 because one team was using metric and the other team was using <laughs> imperial. And you're allowed to laugh because nobody died. Um, <laughs> leaders have been trying to standardise measurements since forever. And that is because measurement is a tool of control. It's a tool of taxation. Um, it's a tool of trade. It's also a tool of justice. You will always see justice depicted with the scales, balancing both sides of the evidence. Mm -hmm. The Code of Hammurabi shows us, we zoom in here, and we see God sat here, handing the king the yardstick and the measuring tape. And that is a common, throughout every ancient, measurements are such a huge theme of ancient texts. Um, in 1984, um, the, the Orwellian dystopian novel, Measurement is a tool of control. They have to use the metric system. Orwin, Orwell was an imperialist, of course. Um, there we, this is from the, the uh, Book of the Dead in ancient Egypt. And again, you see the scales, a common theme. And by the way, that is why often people wonder, why are there 16 ounces to a pound? Why does that make sense? Well, you cut it in half, you weigh it in the scales. You cut it in half, you weigh it on the scales. 16, 2, 4, 8, 16. It's, there's a mathematical binary beauty to it, the power of division. Um, Magna Carta declared that there is one to be one measure of wine throughout our kingdom and one measure of ale and one measure of corn. You can see what the priorities of the uh, medieval English were um, and, um, and so on. And right up to the Bible, the opening words of the Bible, the opening chapter establishes our measures of time the days and the week. And this is something that the revolutionaries in France tried to do with, do away with, when they brought in the metric system in 1794. They also gave us metric time. How about that? And they changed our system of time. One day would now be 10 hours, 10 decijours. There would be 100 minutes to an hour, and um, one minute uh, would be 100 seconds, and a week would be 10 days. And this was... Part of the plan of the rational enlightenment thinking, it was an attack on the church. They were trying to erode the power of the church because they figured if the Sabbath, if the day of rest came once every 10 days, then people could only go to the Sabbath, to church on the Sabbath, effectively once every 10 weeks. And so that was their plan. Unfortunately, their undoing was the French work ethic. Um, because only one day off every 10 days instead of every seven, they were like, no, we're not having that. And uh, eventually, Napoleon abandoned it and went back to the traditional system of time. So we're going to have a little bit of fun. Hello, sir. Welcome, welcome. 
Um, we're going to have a little bit of fun here. We are going to look at the world as our ancestors would have seen it, without mobile phones, without measures, uh, without, um, you know, tape measures and, and so on. And I am going to put one brick down randomly here, let's put it down there, and I'll put one brick down randomly there, and I'm going to use you as a guinea pig again, sir, if that's all right. I want you to tell me the distance between those two bricks, and you're allowed to get up and measure it, or you can just... Um, guess it. Three yards. Three yards, right. I am now going to tell you the exact uh, distance. One, two, oops, it's actually quite hard to balance. Three, four, five, six, seven, I'm going to say seven foot one. Uh, I'm going to guess that. Right, sir, if I could ask you to uh, help me measure this out. And uh, you hold it down there, and we're going to come are you going on the inside? Uh, on the inside, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's going to come out as, it's actually seven foot two. There we go. So I was out by a little bit. But that's how people would have measured. Traditional measures are all based around the human body. And a foot, now the official foot, is quite simply a size 10 foot with a shoe on it. Now I actually have size nine uh, feet, but I've got these enormous trainer things because I broke my ankles last year and I have to wear these shoes. Um, and you can see um, that these are ancient foot measurements. The R foot today is exactly the same as the ancient Greek foot. Um, and there's a slight, the largest foot in history is the Pied du Roi, the French king. Of course, the king would have bigger feet than the rest of us. Um, but the uh, ancient rulers, the, 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 the measures came from the king's body. So the, the national foot would be based on the king's foot. The yard, for example, was once the distance from the end of the king's nose to the end of his uh, um, fingertips. The pharaoh's cubit, the cubit in Egypt was the distance from the pharaoh's um, elbow to the end of his uh, fingers. But it meant that with a new, if you had a vain new ruler who came in, it meant you kept having to change the measurements ever so slightly. And what's quite interesting here is you'll see the Spanish, Argentine, Japanese feet much smaller than the Danish, Hungarian, and German foot. And it's thought that the reason for that is not because those countries people have smaller feet. It's quite simply that in cold countries people tended to wear bigger shoes. <laughs> um, and here we have right at the bottom the megalithic foot, which was the um, foundational, the principal unit in the design of Stonehenge one of the oldest buildings um, in the world, of course. And a lot of people, because the, the, the traditional measurements are all based around the body, and we are the body, you know, God made man in, in his own image, and you see these ancient buildings like Stonehenge, which are supposed to reflect the stars and so on. There's a big argument that traditional measures are in many, many ways sacred, um, you know, and divine. It's not somewhere we're going to go today, um, but nevertheless, that is... That's worth knowing about. Now let's just, I'm going to get you to measure something else. I, what I'll do is I'll get you to measure the height of this chair. And I'm going to move these bricks because I've fallen on those bricks in previous shows. <laughs> much to the hilarity of the audience, um, but not to mine. So, sir, I'm going to use you as a guinea pig if I may. I want you to tell me what the height of that chair is. And the problem with... In hands or feet? in whatever measurement system you like. Um, but you're, you're thinking on the right lines because we, can't, we can use feet to measure distance or strides, but measuring height is more pra problematic um, because you've got to do a sort of John Cleese walk to get up the side of the thing. Eight hands. Eight hands, well you're thinking on exactly the right lines. We would use hands to measure height and a hand would be where the thumb joins the hand there at the widest point, that would be a hand. And the hand is now officially standardised at four inches. But it's surprising how many people's hands are in fact four inches. And similarly with feet, most people have, most men have size eight, nine, ten or eleven feet. Most women five, six, seven. Um, and by the way, it might be ever so slightly uh, Maybe sexist isn't the right word, but I've always said a man's foot or a man's hand. And women obviously have smaller body parts. And so there have been the observation that maybe traditional measures are slightly patriarchal. 
and they probably are, um, you know, because they came from much more patriarchal um, societies. Um, by the way, one famous uh, unit that was um, designed around a woman's body part is the champagne glass. <laughs> you know that one? Marie, An Marie Antoinette's breast, apparently, was the measure for the champagne glass. <laughs> How that came around. No wonder the French revolted. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, here we go. So we got one, two. Oh, I didn't do that very well. Let's do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hands. Well done. <laughs> now, eight hands, if, if you know that four inches... Uh, there are four inches to a hand, and I, I know my hand is typical, um, and you've got uh, eight hands, that would be th 32 inches. Good at measuring, not very good at maths. And, uh, <laughs> but let's, um, yeah, I saw you looking at me blank, and let's just measure it anyway and just see exactly what it is. There you go. 32 inches, right on the knuckle. Well done. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> And another interesting, if I, if I, um, who's got normal size hands? Have you got a normal, you look quite big. If I hold your span out like that, and that should come out at eight inches. There you go, eight inches. Right, there you go, eight inches. So you've got the, the hand, which would be four, the span that would be eight, and then the foot that would be 12. There's a, there's a remarkable um, proportional consistency to traditional um, measures. And so um, the brick, is the defining, this has defined architecture in this country, and the brick is a hand in width, for obvious reasons, because the builder needs to hand it. And if I put four bricks on top of each other, with a bit of mortar in between, that would be a foot. And if you put them along that way, with a little bit of mortar in between, that would be a yard. And that it's inherently proportional, and that's defined so much architecture. Nice little um, story for you. Over many years of having horses and carriages, it was discovered that the optimum width to move two horses pulling a carriage was 14 hands. And so carriages would be built everywhere with the wheels 14 hands apart. When the first trains, uh, the first tracks were laid, Stevenson, you would have horses pulling the locomotive. So they laid the tracks 14 hands apart because that just made sense. And that measurement has stuck. And right now, for example, NASA would dis um, design their rocket launcher knowing that it had to be transported by train through tunnels that had been designed to fit trains going through. And so the humble hand defines the measurements of NASA's rocket launchers. Um, we've got the thumb, which is quite simply an inch is a thumb pressed down. Wonderful uh, measurement, wonderfully practical. If you're banging nails into the wall, you bang your nail in, you stick the thumb in, you bang your nail, not into the thumb, and you keep going <laughs> up. And you'll find that um, with in American walls, you will see, um, they don't use bricks, but they'll put their, um, their studs in the wall, and the studs will be uh, 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 every four hands, uh, every 16 inches. And if you look at some tape measures that have inches in them, you can't see this, but there'll be a, every 16 inches, there'll be a little star in the tape measure. And so that's how the builder knows to where to um, bang the nail. Similarly, thumb, very good. Pipes, they're always an inch. Stick your thumb in, blocks the pipe. Very good for plumbers. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, and the word thumb and inch is interchangeable in hundreds uh, of different languages around the world. And again, that's a very useful measure for small, small practice. We've got the cubit, which we already talked about. It's the principal unit in the pyramids. Apparently, we couldn't build the pyramids today, even if we wanted to, uh, partly because uh, I read it on the internet, so who knows. But the, um, the, the central founding blocks are so heavy, cranes couldn't lift them. And even if we could, um, the materials that we use, concrete, steel, and glass just wouldn't last as long as the pyramids had. You'd also need a lot of slave labour. And, um, <laughs> and the, the pharaoh's cubit would be, he, there would be one standard rod held wherever the pharaoh lived, and every once a month the royal surveyors would all have to meet and check their rods against the official rod, and if their rods were out, they would be executed. And that was the way by which the cubit was standardised. 
and you would have ropes and every cubit you would tie a little knot in the rope and that's how they would build these huge, and it's exactly, if you trace it up now, it's exactly 440 cubits, the Great Pyramid, and 280 high. Great line, man is the measure of all things. And that's where imperial measures come from. We've got um, Da Vinci's notes to himself, his Vitruvian man. And if I stand out like that, that my hand span out there will precisely match my height. And so that became the fathom, which is six foot. Very good measurement for measuring depth because you tie the rope round your hands like that, you've got the rope, and then you can measure how deep you're in. And of course, six foot is a useful measure in water. It's the height at which we start to drown in. <laughs> you can sort of just, just survive in six foot of water without having to swim by bouncing. And um, you can um, see th this inbuilt proportion so, um, who has, I'm not, I'll, I'll pick on you, sir, if I may. Um, actually, I'm not going to, because you look, who's got, they would say, has a normal sized hand? Uh, is a gentleman with a normal, you've got massive hands. Man. Uh, I'll get you to do it. We'll, we'll do it. We'll, um, I'm going to give you this piece of paper, and I'll give you a pen. And I'm just going to leave you with this. And I just want you to mark, this is a foot long piece of paper, and if you mark, just mark there, where your hand is, and then mark there where the, where the next hand is. Okay. And I'll, I'll leave with, yeah, with you to do that, because it's, it's, do you want something to rest on? Or are you okay to do it? Uh, I think it's. Just do it roughly there. And, and sh shout when, when you've done it. <laughs> Come and get me when you've done it. <laughs> so we have um, a bushel of corn, is roughly what a man can carry. There's a man uh, carrying a bushel of corn with a fag in his mouth. <laughs> a stone is the amount you can lift without strain. A pint is the amount that will quench an ordinary thirst. A gallon is the amount, eight pints, is what you can carry on a journey. A furlong is 200 metres. It's the distance that a man can sprint for, a uh, man of reasonable fitness can sprint for <laughs> before he has to slow down. So they're all very, very useful measures around the world around us. Thank you, madam. Done very neatly. And so um, we've got a foot long ruler here, and I'm going to fold the measurement here around where your hand measurement came in, more or less. Okay, and then I just want you to fold that in half one more time. It's like Darren Brown. And, uh, <laughs> and then fold it in half one more time. And that's what, what we have there is almost an exact replica of a 12-inch ruler. Can you see? I'll hold up the ruler to it like that. And those folds almost exactly correspond with where the inches are on the ruler. And what, oh sorry, you can see, there we go. Can you see? Yeah. And so what that demonstrates is there is an inherent interrelationship between all these measures, between inches, feet and yards, even if they don't make mathematical sense. And that, the, the proportions are all based around the, the proportions of the human body and it's intrinsic to the system. And there's a common argument that one of the reasons that modern architecture is so ugly is that they use centimetres and metres, and there is no inherent proportion uh, to centimetres and metres. But just by using traditional measures, there is an inher inherent proportion that relates to the human body, and because we naturally find the human body attractive, we naturally find these proportions attractive as well. Yardsticks. We've got a chap from India, we've got a chap from Africa, and we've got a chap from Ireland, and it's a common thing to see the, the rural gentleman carrying his walking stick. Not because he can't walk without a limp, it's a useful thing if you need to fight off an animal, uh, or, but it's the yardstick, and it's common to pretty much every tradition in the world. A yard is a fantastic measure, it's a pace, it's the length of your leg, it's half a fathom, and it's just, that's why, he's just carrying his yardstick for, for, for measuring, pointing, it's a useful tool. But if you consider traditional me measures with the logic of the planner, and with the logic of the designer, they just make no sense whatsoever. This is the um, screenshot from Wikipedia that explains how the imperial traditional system works. And I almost think they've done it deliberately to be confusing. You just 
if you try and explain it as, an, as a system, it makes no sense. Here is a question for you. Which weighs more? A pound of feathers or a pound of gold? Does anyone know the answer? So they're all the same. No, you're absolutely wrong. A uh, pound of feathers is 22% heavier because they use different pounds. Um, and there is... The base pound weight is heavier. Traditional measures, is it's not a system. It is a perpetual, ongoing market process. The good measures we stop using, the bad measures we stop using, the good measures we carry on using. Metric is a top-down, designed and planned system. Traditional is a sort of bottom-up process. And if you're into philosophy, it's the difference between positive law, i.e. man-made imposed law, and natural law. Um, this was the great uh, financial secretary of Hong Kong who came from just up the road here in Edinburgh. And he was a great free marketeer, and that was one of his famous lines. A multiplicity of individual decisions will produce a better and wiser result than a single decision by a government or board. And right in that quote, you have the difference between metric and traditional, but also the difference between, you know, I described the culture wars at the beginning, those who favour planning and those who favour free markets. Now, measures come and go. This with new measure we're all using today, the step. We've all got it on our phones and on our mobile. It's not a pace, it's a step. This could be a step, this could be a step, but it sort of vaguely make, makes sense and we have, um, uh, it has its use, 10,000 steps and all of that. Clicks, well, clicks is a new measure. Views, retention rates. Um, we had this death per 100,000, which became a, a measure of political competence uh, during the COVID crisis. Um, Bits and bytes uh, are units of, 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 of computer information. And by the way, they're binary, so you'll notice that you'll, your hard drives will go 32, 64, 128, um, 256, 512, and so on. But they also use metric, because you've got kilobytes and megabytes and gigabytes and so on. Here are some nice little measures from the past. The French would sell their coal in charges, a charge of coal or a charge of coal, which would be 1 12th of a man's daily uh, labour, one twelfth of a miner's daily labour. But collop, wonderful sounding word, was the Irish measure of land, how much grand land you need to graze a cow. Um, the buku was an ancient, oh, uh, not so ancient Russian measurement, which was the, it's to measure distance, and it was measured by the distance from which you could hear the cry of a buffalo. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure wonderfully practical in the, in the vast expanses of Russia, but pretty much useless elsewhere. And then we have from Lapland, the Poronkun Sema, which is the distance a reindeer can run without having to have a pee. <laughs> <laughs> which is about five miles, eight kilometers. I used to have this very um, sort of, he was a bit up his own backside mate when I was at university. But I, we, I remember one time asking him, how far is it from here back to your house? And he came back with the answer, he thought about it, and then he went, two cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd walk back, smoke his fag, and he, it would take him, he would smoke two fags, and that was the distance to get home. But he was actually articulating a Native American measure of river distances, I think, uh, where they would measure the distance by the amount of tobacco they would smoke over the time that they travelled. And this same measure was used by a British colonel in Burma in World War II, this is a story I read a long time ago and it always stuck with me, they had to ambush this Japanese force. The Japanese force was much bigger and better armed than they were. If they went into hand-to-hand -hand combat, whatever, they would all be killed. So they set up this trap and in order for the trap to work, all the Japanese soldiers had to have passed a certain point. If they shot too early, the Japanese soldiers would be alerted and they um, be able to retreat and the British guys would all lose their life. And the soldiers couldn't understand that they were very close, middle of the jungle, uh, and the soldiers were all coming past and, and the Japanese were all coming past and the soldiers were going, do we shoot, do we shoot, sir? And the colonel, the, uh, their leader, just sat there and smoked his pipe and said no. And he carried on smoking his pipe and eventually his, his pipe was out, he tapped it, cleaned it out, put it in his pocket and then said, now you fire. And it was a great victory. But what he'd done is he'd measured out the time and he'd measured out that it takes to cover this distance. 
He'd measured out the time it takes to smoke his pipe. And it, he wanted, firstly, to smoke his pipe to calm his own nerves and stop him making a mistake. But he also wanted to exude calm to his troops. And it's a wonderful, you know, story of psychology, I think. But that was how he did it. And he just, it, the, he doesn't care that our leader's so relaxed, he's just sat there smoking his pipe. But he knew he had to finish his pipe. So he was using a traditional Native American measure. Now, I mentioned all these tiny measurements around the body, uh, these large measurements, feet and so on. How do we measure small sizes, small distances and small weights? Well, the staple crop of the, um, of the world, is probably, of certainly of the ancient world, was barley. And so we would use barley corns to measure small, small sizes. And we still use them today. Shoe sizes are measured in barley corns. And officially now, a barley corn is uh, a third of an inch, but every household would have had some barley corns, and if you were measuring small stuff, they were also the foundation of weights uh, for, for weighing small stuff. So I'm going to pass these barley corns around. If you want to have a look at them, you've probably never held a barley corn before, but that's what they look like. And they're, they're a third of an inch. And shoe sizes would be size zero. The, a child size zero would be one hand, and then you go up in barley corns until you get to two hands, and then you have an adult size zero, and you go up in barley corns from there. Um, do we have any Americans in the room today? No? Well, one, one American over. Are you an American, sir? So you will know that American shoe sizes are one size Correct. bigger than English or British shoe sizes. Do you know why that is? Uh, no, I don't. I shall tell you. <laughs> <laughs> because you start at one, and we start at zero. Oh. A bit like lifts or elevators, you know, you start at one is the ground floor and for us one is the first floor because it's one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, uh, do we have any, um, uh, with continental uh, measures as well, um, a centimetre is too big for a shoe size but a millimetre is too small. So they use the two thirds centimetre measure, which is the pari point. But the pari point was originally a barley corn. And so even though they now use the two thirds of a centimetre measure, that it, it, is, it is still a barley corn. So it's an example of how traditional measures are still used even by another name. And similarly, you would use seeds to measure weight and um, we talk about grains of gold, grains of silver, and carrots, and so on. Um, the furlong, we've, come, we've discussed the furlong a little bit already. Um, the furlong, 200 metres, goes right back to ancient Mesopotamia. The Greeks call it the stadion, and it was the length of their athletic tracks in, in Rome as well. Um, and the furlong was a distance you could plough, uh, have two oxen pulling a plough for, before you had to rest them. And turning the plough around was a big job, so you tended to find uh, fields tended to be quite long and thin, stretching down to the river. And, but as ploughs got better, furlongs got slightly longer, uh, because that's progress. Interestingly, French, the French we would measure their land in journée, in the, uh, the day. And they would measure their land in the day's work of a man. Uh, Germany did the same, they called it Ein Tagwerk, and there would be a Morgan, a morning, would be two-thirds of one day's work. So that suggests that Germans did most of their work in the morning. Um, and it's quite a nice measure because it contains information beyond the dimensions of the land about the soil, about the terrain. Quite interesting. Have we got any Irish in? No? Okay, the Irish acre is much bigger than the English acre. And the reason for that is um, when Oliver Cromwell conquered Ireland, um, he couldn't, didn't have the gold and silver to pay his troops, so he paid them in land instead. And some entrepreneurial civil servant redefined the dimensions of the acre uh, slightly bigger so that they all ended up with more land. So it's just a... a, a it's bent, basically. <laughs> so we have the mile. Now, the mile was originally uh, derived from marching the Roman armies. They had those milestones. You can see them all throughout the Roman Empire. And when you're 
If I was to ask you to calculate the distance from, say, here to the Royal Mile, which, by the way, is not the same length as an English mile, because a Scottish mile is not the same as an English mile, uh, which is not the same as a Welsh mile, uh, which is not the same as a Roman mile. But they're all quite similar. <laughs> I told you it was unplanned. But anyway, if you are, you would, if I said measure the distance from here to the Royal Mile without using, um, you know, Google or whatever, you would probably do it in paces. But, and you see when they marched soldiers, you would often hear the march of soldiers left, 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 rather than counting every step. You count in two steps. You, if you ever count steps when you're running, I, I, often, I often do, maybe I'm a bit weird, but I find myself counting in two steps. And two steps is five foot. Um, uh, it's not two yards because, because of the crossover of the foot. Two steps is five yards. And a mile was simply a thousand mille, um, uh, five pay, a, a, a thousand pay passus, which is two steps. So it would be a thousand times five foot, and that was a mile. But then, when we established, we formalised the English mile, as I, instead of counting out the steps and doing it in steps, they decided to do it in furlongs, and there were eight furlongs to a mile. But as I said, um, plough technology improved, so the furlong got slightly longer, and that is how the English mile became slightly longer than a Roman mile. And a league, by the way, is simply three, three miles, three hours walk. You would walk a mile in 20 minutes. It's, a, it, it's all estimate, but again, it's all based around the human body and so on. Um, a league is about the length of Putin's table. <laughs> so I am going to use you as my guinea pig now, madam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to take a handful of potatoes. You can use both hands, but ultimately I want you to just take as many potatoes as you can carry easily in, in greedy potatoes. <laughs> I just want you to carry as many as you can hold in one hand, comfortably. But you can use two hands to load them. Oh, well, I don't think you can hold that comfortably. They're all you need. No, no, no. They that's, no, no, no. Is that comfortable? That's what you can hold comfortably. Uh, well, because you, 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 you're dropping them. Go and, go and weigh how many potatoes that is on the scales. It's, they're quite, um, just be, yeah, put them in one by one because they're quite... Uh, There you go, exactly a pound. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, we'll do the same with, uh, uh, who wants to be the, the guinea pig? I have, uh, have, have I done you? I'll do you, man. Well, take as, many, take as many apples as you can hold comfortably in one hand. Well, I, 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 I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna cheat and then knock him. See, you can hold four apples comfortably. No, 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 because you're balancing it on the top. Go and weigh that. Go and weigh that. Mr. Big Hands. And there you see, it comes out at a pound again. And it's quite simple. A pound is probably the oldest measurement we have in the world. Um, and it's just what somebody can hold in one hand. A stone, you can see the picture of the stone here. It's a sort of relatively heavy stone. And we've got all these measurements from the Roman pound to the Russian funt to the Parry pound, the Dutch pound, the metric yin, the Malaysian catty, and they're all pretty close to each other around this one pound weight. And then you've got the kilogram, which is, which is way heavier. And, that's, and the Babylonian mina, by the way, the most oldest measurement we know of, was a pound. I talked about the division. Two's a really good number. If you try and cut a cake or a pie into tenths, it's much harder. But you cut something in half, you cut it in half again, cut it in half again. Um, a pint was once a pound. It's the same word. It was once a pound uh, of, of liquid, 16 ounces of liquid. I mentioned this, the threat that the British felt by this new French metric system in, in 1824. And somebody had the idea that a gallon, instead of being... Um, eight pounds of liquid, they should increase it to 10 pounds of liquid. So we could be decimal two. And so that's what they did. But at this point, it was still eight pints to the um, gallon. So the pint effectively got revalued upwards yes. by a quarter. Mm -hmm. And exactly, yes, it was a great result for beer drinkers across the empire. <laughs> that their pint suddenly got bigger. But because it's a practical measure, it's stuck. 
But the American pint is actually 16 ounces, so the American pint is different to the English pint. And we have the, the, the rhyme, a pint of water weighs a pound and a quarter. Now, I took this photo last night in a pub uh, just up the road there. And it's the, every pub in the country has to display this sign acknowledging the Weights and Measures Act of 1985 and that their gin, rum, whiskey and vodka will be sold in 25 uh, milliliter quantities. 25 milliliters is effectively a fluid ounce. And if I was to fill my mouth up with water and spit that water out, not bursting, but just take a mouthful and spit it out, it would fit into an espresso glass, precisely, or a shot glass, precisely. So that fundamental one ounce of fluid is a mouthful. Again, it's all around the body. Um, it's based around the body, and we're using 25 milliliters now. It's metric, but it's the same measure. It's a mouthful, and there would be 16 mouthfuls to a pint. <laughs> and uh, a, pine, a pound, of course, was once a pound of sterling silver. That's where we sit, why we say per pound sterling. And there would be 240 pence to um, uh, a pound of sterling silver. And any mathematicians out there will tell you about the beauty of the number 240 because it's so divisible. And, it's, and in those days, you know, you were dividing physical money. It, money wasn't digital like it is now. It doesn't matter now. But in those days when you were dividing actual metal, um, uh, that's, that's why it was designed like it, like it did. The dollar was probably the world's first decimal currency, designed by Thomas Jefferson. Um, decimal mathematics was gaining in popularity, starting with this chap, Simon Stephen of Bruges, the Dutch Archimedes, and he wrote a book called Dismay, The Art of Tense, and that's where we get the dime from uh, in, the old, uh, um, uh, in the old, uh, in the old, in the modern American system. And he, but he kept the quarter, the quarter, would be a piece of eight from the Spanish dollar. Um, we are running short of time, so I plough on. Now, ten is a very natural number to us. We have ten fingers. Uh, it's a very good number for counting. It's good for calculation. It's good for mathematics, for computation. Less good for division, but it's linear and logical. Um, so we're going to tell you now the story of metric. How did the metric system come around? It's against this be backdrop of decimalization of mathematics um, and tenths. And this chap, Arthur Young, went traveling around France and he noted that there were um, different measures everywhere you went in the country. Different towns would have their own pints and their own pounds. The right to define measurements was a right of the nobility. And I got this statistic from the BBC, so it must be true. <laughs> there were, in pre-revolutionary France, a quarter of a million different weights and measures across the country. Um, it enabled all sorts of fraudulent tax collection, fraudulent reporting. Um, the savants, the metropolitan and liberal elite of France, were appalled by it. And when they submitted their, chi, their book of complaints um, before the actual revolution, they demanded one king, one law, one weight, one measure. And their idea was instead of designing a system around the human body, they were going to design a system around the earth itself. Uh, and they were going to measure the distance from the North Pole to the equator, and a metre would be one ten millionth of that distance. And it would be a universal measure, a system for all people for all time. Um, one of the architects was this chap, Pierre-Simon Laplace, who wrote this wonderful line, the peasant will get such immense satisfaction out of knowing what percentage of the planet his patch of land <laughs> takes up. <laughs> um, and these two scientists, Jean-Baptiste Delon and Pierre-Francois Méchain, were tasked with measuring the, um, the Earth's quadrant. But they couldn't get to the North Pole, and they couldn't get to the equator. So they decided they would do it on a line of longitude from uh, Dunkirk to Barcelona instead, and they would extrapolate it from there. And he used, they used a system of mathematics called triangulation, and this uh, repeating circle was their tool, and they'd measure the distance between high points and calculate it from there. Now, the fundamental premise was flawed because the Earth isn't a perfect sphere, 
and the rugged terrain in France doesn't necessarily reflect the terrain that's elsewhere. Nevertheless, this chap, Mechin, on the left, had an absolute mare. <laughs> Firstly, um, they saw this weird um, repeating circle, and he was accused of being a tax collector, <laughs> being a tax assessor. And um, in, in revolutionary France, the tax collectors were all beheaded. <laughs> so he had to, uh, and he was in prison for a bit, then he got out of prison, then he was accused of being a sorcerer, and he got imprisoned again. Then he was accused of being a spy. Then his money ran out because he was carrying the French assignat, which suffered from hyperinflation. And what was supposed to take a few months ended up taking seven years. And here's the thing. In the end, he botched the data. <laughs> he made it up to match exactly what they thought was going to happen, but he botched the data. Um, and the distance they were out was 1,966 metres, two kilometres. But on a per metre basis, that's just 0.2 of a millimetre. So it's a tiny amount, a hair's breadth. But nevertheless, the calculation was flawed. It, it matters in high precision science, but they decided to keep this meter that they'd come up with for various reasons. And somebody made a, a platinum bar was made and kept in the Academy of Science, and the platinum bar would be the official measure, a bit like the Pharaoh's cubit. And conquests will come and go, declared Napoleon, but this work will endure. And in 1794, it was made official. Of course, the people on the street don't always do what their leaders want them to do. <laughs> Nobody used it, despite them smashing up people's scales in the marketplace. And eventually, in 1812, Napoleon pulled the plug and they went back to the traditional system. And Napoleon wrote this about the metric system. Nothing is more contrary to the organisation of the mind, of the memory and of the imagination. It's just tormenting the people with trivia. It will doom France to generations of difficulty. It was not enough for them to make 40 million people happy. They wanted to sign up the whole universe. But as France, as Napoleon's empire fell apart, Belgium, where everything that's bad begins, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Holland stuck with this new metric system. And then France had another revolution in 1830, and after that, they adopted this new metric system. As the South American nations uh, severed their ties with Spain and Portugal, they all started to adopt the metric system. And what we've discovered is that the metric system tends to follow periods of political upheaval. And where the new regime comes in, it wants to divorce itself from what went on in the past. And one way of doing that is by establishing this new metric system. And the only case... The only place that adopted it without political upheaval first was bizarrely Britain between 1965 and 1975. That was the transition period, but we are still transitioning. <laughs> and, um, but it's interesting that, that there's this relationship between measurement and politics. Over the course of the 19th century, it was discovered there was various problems with this official platinum bar. Um, first it got scratched, then it got bent slightly, then the surface got pitted, and then they discovered <laughs> that the guy who'd made the original bar had mixed down the platinum and pocketed the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and so the bar was faulty. So they made a, lo a load of new clones of the bar in 1889 and they distributed them to various countries around the world that were now using metric. But it still wasn't a foolproof system. So in 1960, they redefined the meter again this time around the speed of light. But then they discovered that the speed of light is not necessarily... That was the official definition of a metre. And if you can understand... I can't even read it out. And, um, <laughs> but if you can understand that, you're a, you're a better man than me. But they discovered that the speed of light wasn't consistent. So they redefined it again in 1983 around the speed of an atom. And that, by the way, is an atomic clock, in case you've never seen one. <laughs> so it went from measurement around the body, measurement around the earth, Measurement around the universe, the speed of light, to measurement around an atom. But each redefinition preserved that original erroneous length. And so the biographer, Ken Alder, who's a great historian of this, called it an error for all people, for all time. 
And by the way, after the show, lots of people come up to me and they've all got, look, everyone has their own little stories. And one chap came up to me and said, you do know, by the way, that the speed of light is one foot per nanosecond. <laughs> uh, which is, so they could have used feet. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and this, William Rankin was an English engineer and he wrote this piece of verse. A party of astronomers went measuring of the earth and 40 million meters they took to be its girth. 500 million inches, though, go from pole to pole. So let's stick to inches, feet, and yards, and the good old three-foot roll. Uh, rule and pole don't rhyme, but anyway. <laughs> but actually, the distance from pole to pole is 500 million, 500,000 inches. So it's quite a nice round number. And similarly, if you were to take the circumference of the Earth, it is 12 to the power of 5. 248, well, 12, you would lose that decimal point. But there's a a relationship between miles and the dimension of the Earth. Really, what we should use is nautical miles, but anyway, that's a subject for a different day. The litre is also a flawed measurement, so flawed that the Système International, which is like the sort of IMF for measurements, has actually now abandoned the litre. But we, we have, we're running short of time, so we plough on. Now, um, in 1975, the metric lobby had been campaigning hard for America to adopt the metric system. And in 1975, it was declared the preferred system of weights and measures for the United States trade and commerce. But 50% of Americans still didn't know what it is. And when they realized what the government was doing, Gerald Ford was the president, and there was a big fight back. Metric is definitely communist, um, <laughs> said this chap, Dean Crackle. Uh, um, one monetary system, one language, one weight and one measurement system, one world, all communist. It was a, the same argument, anti-globalist argument that you hear today. Um, and this is I, I, almost my best story of the whole talk. They, people went around wearing these um, <laughs> T-shirts and there was a great campaign against it and eventually Reagan abandoned it in 1982. But they ran this ad campaign in 1979, this pro-metric ad campaign. And I do voiceovers for a living, that's my day job, and I've always done it for years and years. And I was once, I remember once narrating this documentary, and this sentence came up that these larvae travel many kilometers. So I said that, and then the producer goes, no, 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 it's not larvae, it's larvae. And it's not kilometers, it's kilometers. And then the sound engineer piped up, goes, no, it's not larvae, it's larvae. <laughs> and this huge argument about how to pronounce this word. And in the end, we had to phone up the great arbiter of pronunciation in the UK. They give the guidelines to the newsreaders and so on, which is the BBC Pronunciation Unit. And this lady answered the phone. And what I heard was, BBC Pronunciation Unit. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm all into equal opportunities. And all the rest of it. <laughs> got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, we, so we've got this problem. We don't know if it's larvae, larvae, or larvae. And I then got this wonderful reply, I don't know, pet, I don't speak Latin. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we asked her about kilometre or kilometre, her hand went over the receiver. And she had this long conversation. You could hear her just talking to someone in the office. And then the hand came off the receiver. And she went, can you not just say mile? <laughs> <laughs> So with that in mind, when the metric ad campaign went in America, the chap, well, the chap said kilometer. But the correct pronunciation is in fact kilometer, as in centimeter and millimeter. A kilometer, as in a mileometer or a speedometer, is a different kind of meter. So the guy in the big ad campaign for metric in America pronounced it wrong. And the metric ball were absolutely furious, but it's spread from there. And so because Americans say kilometer, the rest of us all say kilometer. But like the original measurement, meter measurement itself, it's wrong. <laughs> and, and the correct pronunciation is, is, if you're a Latin scholar, you would say la y. Not with a verb, but with a y, la y. But because la v is in common parlance, and David Attenborough says it, uh, <laughs> say, la v. So there have been two... Huge, hugely important measures in the last um, I don't know, generation or so. And the first of them is the shipping container. This has transformed international trade because suddenly you can just take the container, take it off the ship and put it on the train or put it on the truck. You don't need to unload it and reload it. It's dramatically shortened um, 
uh, unloading times, docking times. It spends, means that ships can spend more time at sea. It's been a great development in, in efficiency. It means that people can't nick out of the containers. And it was um, uh, invented by an American dude who did it in feet. Eight foot by eight foot by 20 foot. And that is a defining measure for international trade. A second great development is computers and decimals have almost destroyed fractions altogether. Fractions make more sense to us in our mind, but we, we don't use them when we use computers. Um, an eighth in dec decimal is 0.125, um, and so you find the eighth of a mile, the furlong, has pretty, pretty much died with odometers. We just say a tenth of a mile now. And so computers have secretly, in a way, made us all decimal or metric. So, you know, all these ongoing forces at play, I hope I've described to you that there is a beauty to traditional measures. And before you dismiss them, appreciate that beauty, an inbuilt proportion. And what is good about one system doesn't negate what is good about the other. We need a precise universal system for science, for precision engineering, for human safety. And metric is that system for now. It's logical, it's simple. But it is abstract, and it is not based in the, in the world around us. So one way or another, we will always use traditional measures, even if by another name. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the fringe.